Okay. Okay, ladies, we are live here and uh, oh. uh, we are ready to go for a very interesting and inspiring session today because we have somebody very prominent, very famous, who's made headlines in various newspapers and channels, various media. And this is one and only the human rights lawyer, advocate Jas Uppal. And here she is, I mean, there she is on the screen for you, the human rights lawyer. And let me give you a short introduction about her. Uh, the famous Kulbushan Yadav case, if that gives us some kind of memory relapse, we all know that uh, the Sarabjit Singh case, which was handled by our very own advocate trust Kupal. So other than that, actually, she has her own company which is uh, called, um, let me just look for it. There it is. Yeah. Justice she, Upheld. Yes, um, Justice Upheld. Justice Upheld. She's attorney working in UK on the Sarabjit case and human rights lawyer and the founding trustee of Justice Upheld. This is an international human rights organization Justice, justice Upheld aims to help individual victims of human rights abuses to seek redress and justice. Uh, these cases include cases of wrongful arrest, unfair trials, false imprisonment, slavery and enslavement, exploitation of employment rights. That reminds me, I would many a times get, you know, questions like, you know, uh, the employer is harassing or there's been some kind of a issue in the employment in the office. And uh, I would be asked, you know, queries would come, do you know any employment lawyer? So uh, how do we start that? You know, first, before I come to that, I would also like to introduce to everyone here, Savita Bansal, I will just uh, get her here. Uh, Savita Bansal is also an eminent lawyer. And here she is. She is. And uh, she would be helping me moderating the show because as a lawyer, she would have definitely uh, experience to uh, ask relevant questions to advocate just people. So Savita is here. So uh, Savita, I would just go ahead and uh, ask uh, advocate just to tell us something about how did she come into this profession? How, why did she choose uh, to be a human rights lawyer? Can we have you just people advocate? I begin by saying thank you for the wonderful introduction. You really built my part, um, but thank you. Just to clarify, I don't run a company. It's actually a British registered international human rights charity. Um, so it's a, 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 a charity and not, and not a company. I just would like to clarify that. Um, I've been in the legal profession for quite a long time. I dare not even hesitate to think, but... Um, that was to do with uh, uh, English and Welsh law under um, our jurisdiction here in, in the UK. Um, my interest in international human rights came about when I came um, across the case of Sarabjit Singh, um, an Indian national who was um, sentenced to death um, in Pakistan. Um, I was just intrigued by the case, just reading it from a news um, headline. It was a uh, a, a news flash about his execution had been stayed that day. That was on the uh, 24th of June in 2009. Um, the news report contained very few details other than that the execution had been stayed in a bit background. And it just, um, it was a seminal moment for me and I wanted to know more about the case. There was a lot of things that were missing. So I was trying to find the background to the case and a Google search um, 
contain some newspaper articles or YouTube articles. And of course, those are not the best sources for facts. And so I was trying to get hold of contact with the family, um, naively expecting them to have a team of lawyers only to discover that they didn't. Um, and that motivated me to get involved and um, establish contact with the family to find out more. Um, they didn't even have the um, copies of the, the court papers. And I understand that they were struggling to find somebody in Pakistan to uh, represent them. And about that time, another lawyer, uh, Pakistani lawyer, Mr. Sheikh had got involved as well. So, which was a good thing because I could liaise with him to find out. But nevertheless, we still didn't get the court papers, um, the, the evidence that they relied on. So we couldn't, we were trying to find out if we could have advised him to appeal, to what else he could do uh, about his, um, uh, the sentence against him. Um, so that, that was my original interest um, in, in the case. And as a consequence, um, a lot of other people came forward, uh, which, which hopefully we'll be able to discuss, um, referring to other cases. And that led to uh, quite a opening of the Pandora's box, as it were, because um, it revealed there was quite few people who were um, illegally, it seems, and unlawfully imprisoned in, in, in Pakistan. Um, that included a gentleman who was 76 year old, um, who'd been there for 36 years, would you believe, uh, without a trial. The, the allegation was that he was a spy. That sort of seems to be the stock in hand response. Um, and I found it quite intriguing that even the Indian authorities didn't seem to be helping these people. There was no counsellor access. Um, the 76 year old gentleman was Mr. Sajid Singh from, from the Punjab. And he, his daughter, when I asked her, well, well why didn't you contact it? Uh, why didn't you do anything before? To me, you know, privileged in the Western world, etc. that you, you would want to know why that person has not been released and why has he been in prison for 36 years? What, what has the family done or what has the lawyers done? Um, she responded by saying that we, we didn't know he was alive. We thought he had passed away. And I said, well, when did you find out that he was alive? She said, five years ago. And I said, well, what did you do? And, and she put me in my place. She said, um, you know, you don't understand, madam. We, you know, nobody helps us. We've got no one to approach. We can't approach um, politicians. And I didn't mean to ask her in, in a sort of direct way, well, why didn't you do anything? But I, I just found it shocking. So I explained why I had asked that. And so it, fortunately he was released eventually, albeit after 36 years. And he sadly passed away about three years ago, but he died a free man. And talking to him, I was trying to find out what sort of treatment he got what, um, you know, whether he had access to uh, medical treatment and the answer was very um, minimal, you know, that it was very minimal medical treatment and access to counsellor services, as you know, is a right, um, was, was not available to him. So he spent 36 years and there were others. Uh, some had spent 10 years, some had spent six years um, and they were also subsequently released. Um, but again, they, they said the same thing. We, we didn't get any help. They just accepted their fate. Some of them didn't even go to trial. It was, well, you know, you, you cross the border and, and therefore you are wrong and therefore you go into prison. And I find it absolutely alarming in uh, 2021. In, in, in those cases, I go back about five, six years now, that um, that, that was... Uh, that, that was their fate, that they had no one to help with. It's only if they've got family back home who would be able to say, well, they're missing, we, we need to do something, or we know where they are uh, in, in order to take action. It should be the government's job, of course, but there we go. Oh, really? I, 
have no words like you know how you came into this and it's been very touching story we've been following uh, sarabjit's case all these years and the sister's plight uh, it's horrifying to uh, find uh, no help and no support from either the government either india or pakistan uh, it must have been uh, very Uh, difficult for you to uh, especially emotionally uh, calm the mom the sister and to convince them that uh, justice delayed is uh, but uh, you would get some kind of a relief savita do you have something to add on here yes i just good evening to you Uh, it's really lovely to know the work uh, you are doing in the field of human Thank rights you. and how you're helping those who don't have the resources or access to justice system so what for everyone to know i would like to ask like you know how do you explain human rights and what do you think it's important like you know why it's important and what is their relevance in everyone's life so that like you know people know they should be aware absolutely it's extremely important because um after the second world war you, the united nations uh, declaration on human rights was um made available it, it was it was to um so that there was no never going to be any injustice i mean that's the premise behind it but it was all very hopeful it was about enshrining the rights of individuals which are inalienable rights you can't overlook them and a lot of countries around the world um with our signatories to that there are some that are not but they it's very difficult to explain human rights even for lawyers as you as you'll um appreciate it's it could be an, it sort of relates to the right to life right down to uh right to fair trial right to access justice right to air light absolutely every children's rights employment rights women's rights um minority rights minorities so uh, um um people and 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 their rights so it it encompasses if you think about it, it encompasses everything um in, in relation to hu- human beings and these are adopted in legislation uh, around the world and as well as the um you know being aware of the conventions and and for example they could exist in employment rights about equality um ensuring equality as i said access to justice and these also are sometimes mirrored in the constitution of countries for example the indian constitution that has got some um uh, human rights already um you know a p- part of the constitution but the difficulty is they're rarely enforced um for example in the current cases as current as today i've got a lady who's an indian national whose family contacted me um she's in qatar she went out there um via an agent or a so called recruitment agents who by the way are unregulated um in in parts of indian rural parts of india so she went out to work there and there is no other way to describe it but she's enslaved the the person the enslaver has now destroyed her mobile phone and the family were wondering or you know got no contact with her it has been reported to the indian authorities but there's no understanding that those are it's a human right not to be enslaved and there's no urgency to um intervene uh, um it's um so so again that the someone high up in the indian authorities for example is unaware that she is a victim of enslavement i've had um people come back to me from the authorities to say well she went out there what what does she expect sort of thing well she didn't go out there to be enslaved she went out there to work and and also uh, one of the criticism it's not have a go at the authorities but it needs to be said is they don't listen to their own national they rather go to the so called employer and ask what the difficulties are but the priority should be talking to their national to find out what the issues are what they're suffering that this lady was actually being beaten up um so that's, uh, it, it's like you know 
almost pleading with them, you've got to intervene. That's not acceptable. The police should be involved. Um, and as recently as two weeks ago, we rescued 12 Indian uh, ladies from Goa who, again, were victims of um, exploitation by so-called recruitment agents in India and, and Dubai, and then uh, they ended up in Iraq. Now, no, everyone knows that's not exactly a safe place, but um, so they ended up there. They were promised um, human traffic they were from uh, via Dubai. And, um, and you, I mean, you, you would think that's a giveaway. If you're some, getting into trucks, they, they would realize that this isn't right. We shouldn't be doing this. But I don't, whatever they were promised, um, such as jobs in the hospitality trade, um, medical care, and, and, and the retail trade. That's what they were promised. And that's what they uh, sort of signed up for, as it were. And again, having said that, signed up, they're not proper employment contracts. They're just, you know, you're going there with me and we're going to give you some money. And, and their light, eyes light up. And so they went there and they ended up at the airport being given away to private rich families. Um, and they were forced to clean swimming pools without any PPE uh, equipment. So they had to do it with their bare hands. And I've seen the photographs that were all red, you know, that they, they, uh, they weren't allowed to eat. One's been locked up and I'm trying to find out where she is. She's actually from Nepal. I just point that out because um, the, the, unfortunately they suffer a lot as well because they haven't got um, uh, uh, consulates or embassies in, for example, in Iraq. Um, again, they, they don't seem to understand the urgency uh, of, of getting these women uh, involved because the re natural response seems to be, well, they've gone there to work. And then you try and have to convince them they haven't gone there to be beaten up. One poor lady, a Nepalese lady, was beaten up with a broom and the broom's broken in three pieces. So uh, it's enslavement. They've dictated to us to when they can uh, go out, if they're allowed out, their passports are confiscated. And, and this, this is a practice, it's called the kafala system, which uh, unfortunately operates widely in um, the, the uh, um, Gulf states. And it's, there is no other way of describing it, it's enslavement. Um, and it's not just about the Indian authorities or the Nepalese or, or these guys. I think the whole wide world needs to be, be um, made aware because it's not just Indians or um, we, we don't go out to help just Indians, we help whoever we can. And we've got um, quite a few people of different nationalities that we've been helping and continue to help. Um, so they're all, all victims, uh, well, especially from East Africa. There's quite a few, sadly, again, women who uh, have ended up there because of needs must. And of course, with COVID, that, that's magnified. Um, everyone's desperate to get jobs. So they think uh, we'll, we'll go there, but nobody explains to them um, the, the, the difficulties that can happen um, and, and the obstacles. And they probably see quite naively, it's going there, earning some money, coming back, helping the family. But what they can't share with you is the treatment they have if they are lucky to return. Passports are confiscated. They're not allowed medical treatment. They work 24-7 um, sometimes in some cases. We, a few years ago, we had a lady who had difficulties at home. Um, her husband allegedly was an alcoholic. So, um, and you know, there was no food on the table. So she meets somebody, a woman on Facebook who says, well, why don't you come to Bahrain? Um, you know, I'll help you out, you'll get a job and life would be wonderful. So she did. And then uh, somebody, in fact, it was a friend, it wasn't a family, who contacted me and said, well, we don't know where she is and we've hadn't, we haven't heard from her for some time. Anyway, I located her and she didn't know where she was. Um, you, know, you know, she was, she was in a right state. She was very, very frightened, um, alerted the authorities. And then on that case, credit where credit's due, the authorities responded. And you may be shocked to learn the person who had enslaved her was actually a police officer in Bahrain. You know, that, so again, again, that comes under uh, all sort of um, breaches of human rights, you know, enslavement, that, that, that's obviously 
um, against all human rights, beliefs, etc. And, and these cases are not, um, not not out there in in the general sort of uh, in the on the news. I don't know why. I can't understand why that because I think obviously it's humiliation for the person. I'm not saying show the person, but there should be talk about it so that people it can cascade down. The information can cascade down, and people can make the make informed decisions. Because there's no way can you stop people going abroad to work, but that's what they want to do: go to work to abroad. Um, go abroad to work, sorry, um, not to be enslaved or victims of human rights. So I think the more information that's out there, they'll have a better understanding and make an informed decision. I mean, there's some cases, I, uh, purpose of this um, invitation, which I'm grateful for, is to let you know what's going on. There are women who have been, and men, who have been victims of sexual violence. So they're not going to go home, back home and say, well, oh yes, well, we worked and, and this happened to us. Um, because it's you know it's not acceptable it's humiliation so you need to speak up about that and then I suppose when you come back home you've been working abroad you come back with presents you come back with money and and you know stories to tell um, and, and it looks all wonderful and everything and it, and it encourages other people to go out there and, and do the same thing so it becomes a revolving door because nobody's addressing um, this look you know what you should be aware of you should be aware of the agents. And so far, we've only had in recent um, weeks one agent out of um, seven agents who's been actually arrested, but uh, no further action has been taken by others, uh, but by the other uh, police authorities in India. Again, trying to explain to the police in India, uh, I use India as an example because that was the most recent case. They don't seem to understand. They seem to, well, her family needs to come and report it. Does it make a difference who reports it as long as you've got a report and you act on that report? Use your police powers to investigate, contact the authorities in um, in, in these countries to say, well, what, well you, you've got an Indian national who, what, what are you doing? Why, why are you allowing this? Um, and, and, and making sure these people are arrested. Because what happens is those women will be rescued and they've gone back home and it's all wonderful. But the recruitment agents are going to find some other women. You know, India's, for example, India's got over a billion people and I'm sure they'll find somebody desperate enough for looking for work who wants to travel uh, there and uh, again, become victims. So it needs a societal um, approach. People need to be legislation, um, looking at the contracts uh, of employment, uh, letting in the rural areas, and particularly letting them know that this is going on and, and you, you, this is what you need to be mindful of. And as you know, in Western um, uh, countries, you don't pay the agency to get you a job, they charge the employer. Um, so again, it's lack of knowledge. And also, um, you know, we're, we're constantly told that the Indian economy is doing really well. Uh, obviously, like everyone else, we've been, everyone's, uh, India has also been affected by COVID, but nobody um, lets these women know that they can work. I mean, interestingly, uh, a few weeks ago, I had a lady that we had helped um, a few couple of years ago in Malaysia. Um, she was from Punjab. She went out there, very bright lady. She wanted to become a doctor. And I uh, and she explained that she needed money, and so she thought she'd go to Malaysia and work. Again, she was enslaved, rescued, and she returns home. Mm -hmm. And she contacted me recently to say that, um, you know, she got married and they had, uh, uh, she didn't pursue her uh, uh, wish to become a doctor. She, um, although she wanted to, she said it was money was uh, an issue. And she and her husband then purchased some um, shoe shop, which was doing really well. And uh, unfortunately, it was burnt down because somebody thought, you know, we can't uh, allow her to be successful or them to be successful in that region. Mm -hmm. The police weren't interested. They wouldn't help her. And so um, she was desperate to work. And with the lockdown, she started teaching children and charging a fee for them. And to my astonishment, she was doing it all very bright lady, as I said over WhatsApp and I said well haven't you got a laptop and she said no because I can't afford it so 
you know, there's so much potential. That woman, um, you know, switched to from being a doctor um, and, and sort of because of lack of resources. So she wants to teach and she seems to be very good. She had about uh, 40 students. Um, who, who were helping her, but everything was done over WhatsApp. Just think what she could do if she had a uh, a laptop or, or somebody provided those resources, uh, the local authority or how, however it works in India, provided those resources. Unfortunately, as a, as a charity, we um, we can't just send out, there's a lot of process, uh, quite rightly process that needs to be done. We need to have a contact, uh, a registered charity in India uh, with, with a certificate, necessary certificate to, to, to have that. Otherwise we would do that uh, because she's doing something. She's helping the community. And uh, I did ask her, well, what, what, what do you do? Can't you, uh, you know, teach women there? She said, oh, we're in the rural area and they're not interested. They, there's not that engagement. So you've got in, 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 a country like India has got so much potential with, with, with women who, who, you know, often run homes and things and and yet they all they do is cook uh, whatever help out in the house of the family uh, but then they're not allowed to do anything I mean one of the if it wasn't true it would be funny I, I've never very rarely have I come across Indians or, or, or um, yeah well Indians I'll say I'll say it um who've got a hobby it's it's um there's not that engagement and but they're a powerful um you know potential that 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 could be utilized, uh, encouraging to go into the health services and everything. So they won't have to go abroad and be exploited um, because there's a need in India. So why isn't that need being met? And you can't expect the government to provide all the time, but there must be other groups that, uh, who, who can encourage that, um, uh, you, you provide that. And, and there's a lack of awareness of schemes and incentives if you're rural, in the rural areas or you're, illiterate you, you can't access them somebody will come along and say oh I know I can help you uh, fully aware that there's a scheme which is free and direct to available for, for these people but they would then exploit them and say well I can get you onto that scheme I can get you some money but you will have to pay me x amount of money so again it's things like that that needs to be addressed <coughs> Okay, so moving to our next question, actually, it's like, you know, you have answered already a few of my questions, which was on my list. So which is a good thing. And uh, okay, so I the one you just discussed, um, I had a similar scenario in uh, recently, it's not lady from India, it was a lady from Pakistan, a doctor educated. And uh, she recently contacted me. She got married to a British man here, who is settled and uh, so I can see as a migrant, as a spouse, she's suffering. She's literally suffering. She's not allowed to use her phone. When I had to talk to her, she said, okay, I don't even have a credit on my phone. This is how she's abused. No access to money, no access to anything. And it's not like, you know, like a bonded labor, like a modern day slavery, but it's like, you know, she married for a good future and she can do her plan. She can be a doctor here, but she is not allowed to do this. She's so, so controlled that I had to call her and she gave me a time slot of one hour that, okay, mm -hmm. I'll be going to pick my child from the nursery. That is the only time I'll be able to take the call. So obviously like, you know, I called her and, you know, you can relate like, you know, how even educated women, they are also like, you know, um, abused or they are controlled or they are really like you know so it's not exactly the work you're doing but the human rights are involved exactly in this as well and uh, because of like you know they, we just try to find how to help them like you know getting them settlement based on their domestic violence like you know so all those so you, you can feel human rights are involved in every way so going to my next question in this one like you know if I say how do you think human rights impact the life of migrant workers and anything you would like to like you know highlight on that certainly but just just um addressing what you said i know i know you can't talk about cases um that you're dealing with but um savita the i mean the lady is fortunate I'm, I'm really sorry to learn what she's going through but she's fortunate she's in this country because there are absolutely so many resources mm -hmm. she'll get support from as you know social services mm -hmm. Uh, there's loads of charities that will help her and the police will help her if she's a victim of uh, 
um, you know, uh, domestic violence, police are trained, uh, they've got female uh, police officers, and, and uh, domestic violence um, shouldn't be acceptable or tolerated in any country, but definitely it's not tolerated in this country. So she's got those resources. Mm -hmm. Now, migrant mm -hmm. workers uh, that we, people contact us are, um, could be anything, uh, anyone. Um, we we have, get a lot of males as well, who um, are uh, seafarers, again, predominantly from South Asia. Um, so it's India, Nepal, Bangladesh, all uh, the Philippines, all, all, all that part of the world. Um, uh, and they end up working, and they could be working for a shipping company, again, who are registered in, in, um, in the Gulf countries, and they promise all sort of income. And we've had so many cases where they are not paid for not one year, not few months, but six years. So they're on these ships, un often unseaworthy, no, no um, police, uh, 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 protection, no safety or health and safety um, equipment or anything. And, and they're just left there and they won't pay them. So the idea is they won't pay them in the hope that they uh, get fed up and go back to their countries. So they ask their families mm -hmm. to give money, buy a ticket and they go. And, and of course there's certain um, maritime rules and regulations that you can't just do that. You've got to get that signed off, um, et cetera. And so you have those cases, again, those, those are breaches of human rights on many levels. Um, and that resulted in me becoming an advisor for human rights at sea. So we had a plethora of cases and we continue to receive them where this is happening and it needs to be highlighted. And one of the difficulties we experience is getting the media to cover those cases, maybe because um, I think that they should be covered. I, I view it as gross abuse of human rights. It shouldn't be happening anywhere in, in 2021. And, and they talk about modern slavery. There's nothing modern about slavery. It does exist. It's, it's uh, highlighting it and, and, and letting people know that it, it, it's happening right now underneath our noses. And, and of course, there's a supply chain. If those come, people based in shipping company owners um, are, are supplying Europe, you've got a supply chain. And if we're supposed to be all into human rights, we should be check, checking where do those things come from? items we buy and what's their you know vision or, or what's their do they subscribe to human rights and the supply chain is it you know can it be audited so um th those things that need to be looked at and the same applies to uh, people who go out to these countries we've had you, you can't even claim personal injury case the most tragic one of the most tragic cases i came across um was uh, was about two years ago um it was a, a young man who I had three sisters, again, from Punjab. Because of the language I speak Punjabi, I get a lot of people from Punjab. But as I say, I reiterate, we, we, we help anyone. We've had people from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and uh, for the Philippines. Um, anyway, we, we, we will do our best. At the moment, we're dealing with, with a couple of cases from East Africa, from Somalia, and um, of, of human trafficking. And this gentleman, young man, he had um, three sisters. And I think he was the middle or, or the youngest. And he was working in Saudi Arabia and he was supposed to be a driver and he was due to come back home in July um, in 2018. And he, for some reason, unknown reason, he was asked to work with cement, hot cement that he wasn't trained to do or anything like that. He didn't even probably have the protection equipment because uh, as I will explain later, it became a closed shop, nobody would provide evidence. Um, the hot cement fell on top of him and, 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 and basically he, he died. Um, and, uh, you know, his sisters was unbearable. His mother was absolutely inconsolable, as were the sisters. And they were saying that, you know, he was due to come back. All these sisters had got married, he, which he had provided and supported and funded. And, and it was his turn to go back home for good and trying to get information from that company. Even the other migrant workers who were there, they just seized up, they wouldn't provide. And there is no way you could sue. There's no litigation that, you, you know, no, nobody tells you this. The agents don't tell mm. these people that if you die, 
um, you know, that, that there'd be no compensation claims or anything. So what happens is he dies, his body eventually was, um, you know, uh, repatriated to India. And it, there was so much delay, um, you know, that so his family had to delay performing whatever their beliefs were, that those rights and, and everything. And that's not acceptable. I mean, the fact that he died is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, the fact that even in death, his body was allowed to deteriorate even more before it got reached home, before they could be, um, uh, deal with his um, uh, cremation. So again, that's a human rights, even though suddenly he, he died, that those needs to be looked at. Uh, and, um, but you couldn't sue him. As I said, I, I contact the guys he was working with, who were, by the way, uh, migrant workers as well, somewhere from India, somewhere from other, but they 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 just closed, ceased talking, and were unable to provide the information because um, they would lose their jobs or they were told not to. And who's going to sue um, the company in, in Saudi Arabia? His sisters won't. His family won't be able to do that. You know, and, and we, we because we're not getting information, we're still doing something about it, but. But they're not, the company's not going to care because they know, well, he's died. There's two more waiting or four more waiting to come over and take over his job. Um, we've had people who've been in prison, in, again, in the Gulf states, um, and they are uh, treated with absolute disrespect. They're forced, uh, they're given, firstly, their, their arrests are questionable, uh, but they're not lawful, they're just... Um, there and the, the trials, if they're fortunate to have trials, they're conducted in the local languages. There's no interpreters. Again, that's a, a loads of breaches of human rights, um, access to fair trial. Um, they are, if they're Sikh guys, they, they are forcefully um, shaven, that the, the hair is shaven um, because that, that's what the prison rules require. So it means moving, uh, removing the, the star, the turban, and then and they're forcefully shaved. Um, and then they've also, uh, you know, you don't get any medical, that much medical treatment. It's basic and they're all in one room um, and it could be over 25. We, we, we've got loads of photographs and things if anyone's in, uh, interested on our website of, of cases that we dealt with. And, the, and um, they, they don't get access to... Uh, Counselor services or independent legal advice. Uh, they're given halal food, which may be against their beliefs, um, camel meat, which they don't normally eat, but they have to. So again, th those are human rights that they're, they're breached and it should be a big thing. Um, I'm not religious, but um, I do, you know, I'm, I'm falling in the Sikh faith and I respect and I try to do the right thing, uh, uh, go by those uh, beliefs. Um, and human rights are par, are linked in the Dharmic faiths, that they're there. Nobody's pulled them out and, and, and sort of act, uh, acted on them, or, or rather, I should say, a few people have, but not all of them. But the, the, those need to be implemented. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we've got the full, um, you know, every, every breach of human rights that possible that's going on. And th those are the cases, and we, we're trying to highlight them and they should be. I don't think from my experience of the Indian courts that they, the judges are aware of them. And I think, uh, and sometimes lawyers with greatest respect to, to Indian lawyers, they're not there and, they're, and they, they should be there because they're, they're enshrined, most of them are in the Indian constitution and they should be applied. Uh, and people should not be dismissive of them. They're extremely vital and important. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, yeah, we get the full range of these cases. Yes, yeah, similar. Yesterday, I came across a story where uh, a couple from India, they went uh, on their honeymoon to Dubai, and then they, they, they met a sheikh. And uh, so he was quite impressed. The girl was very beautiful. Like, you know, it was a very wealthy couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the sheikh uh, invited them to their, it is, it's a clear breach of human rights. That's why I just, I, I thought of no, no. the story. It's like, you know, came, came as through a friend. So, mm -hmm. and uh, they invited, the sheikh invited them to 
uh, to he had his hotel so he invited them for to the hotel and uh, obviously as they happens like you know the ladies go separately and men go separately in the separate rooms and uh, when the party was over lady was taken and like you know the man he said okay now where is my wife like you know and uh, uh, he said which wife you came alone because there was no registration when they entered the hotel there was no signing nothing at all and so he didn't have any evidence and so you came alone here and uh, if you want like you know i'll call the police and this like he was quite threatened so he, the guy ended up coming back to india without wife and they went on a honeymoon and uh, he obviously he complained to the police authorities they didn't take any action dubai authorities obviously like you know they will uh, they wouldn't take an action because it's their like you know own citizen and uh, shake uh, against uh, an indian person so there was a clear breach of human rights so we don't know like uh, until now uh, the, uh, you know our friends mentioned this and they were some like you know somehow it was one of their relative and uh, so yeah he 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 couldn't uh, never got his wife well that that is uh, horrifying um what, what about the um the, the embassies Uh, obviously i don't know much about it uh, yeah. because that is like in you know, a few years ago so it was just part of conversation we were sitting at night like you know yeah. having a dis- discussion about all and then this came up and we were quite shocked we were quite shocked like you know that uh, when you mentioned the breach of human rights that is also human rights you went to your own police authorities you went to your own uh, like you know uh, embassy but nothing happens yeah well well it should happen uh, i mean what's the point of having them um again the civil service exams in india i know they're very elitist and and your life is made if you if you're successful but again they they do not um from what i gather i haven't seen the recent syllabus but there's no focus on human rights so if they don't know how are they going to identify them i've had a lot of runnings in various um embassies including the indian embassies around the world where they they sort of are asking me well who are you you're not related to them what you do so there's that suspicion that i'm probably gaining something but well, not you know you know and but they don't address the issues they they overlook the issues they're more concerned about my intervention and and what what i think and and you you know for sure they they've got no understanding or recognition of hu- human rights i mean and then you look at other things you come across um the what's happening in india for example cases that have been um th- there's a judicial delay uh th- there was something uh a couple of days ago where a 108 year old man passed away and but his case hasn't been um resolved his his litigation case over a property which has been going on since 1968 Yeah, so you know, yeah but it shouldn't be i mean if you're a democracy um you you would be mindful and be aware of human rights um it shouldn't be i mean if, if uh judicial appointments of judges and and etc i know there's loads and loads of lawyers in india and i've had the fortune of uh, uh, being before the indian supreme court and uh, dealing with, so it was fascinating watching um how it works so the it's it's based on uh, english law uh, but unfortunately you have got the the support system um, that, that that you 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 need um and i think uh, access to the, as well it's like you know, because i have practiced for some few years in india as well so it's more of a corruption as well like you know the the case you're talking about like litigation like you know uh, property litigation matters it goes on because uh, you know there will be dates after date the case will be adjourned for hearings and then the next available date will be after a year or nine months and uh, I, with all due respect uh, our judicial system is a bit corrupted back home so and that that like you know and people know that's why when someone encroaches a property they know it's going to take like you know good few years and by the time one of the person or one of the like you know the main the owner of the property will will like you know will pass pass away and um, this is how how it is it's a very abuse of the system actually yeah but it's not that, that's not it's inexcusable um i wouldn't accept that because if you claim to be a democracy there's loads of responsibilities that come with a democ- being a democratic country yeah. and one of them is human rights it's not just about property i've come across um divorce cases that are ongoing uh for, for years so what happens is that the parties and it applies to both parties 
they're unable to move on, remarry or have contact with their children. And then uh, for some reason, it's quite popular in Punjab, the dowry. Uh, I'm dealing with a case of a, a gentleman and, and, and every time he goes to India, he gets arrested um, because the, the family, his wife, ex-wife family, uh, say the magic words, dowry claim. And, get, and my, to my utter amazement, you don't have to provide evidence, you just need to allege, and then the police pick you up. I mean, how behind and, and you know, backward is that? There's no evidence, you, you, you can't, you, all you have to say is, um, you know, um, he, he wanted a dowry. So they home on in, in on him, uh, usually the male, and then take him now, away. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit, very recently, actually, in such cases, things have changed a bit. Now the police, uh, uh, like, you know, they is under responsibility to the, do the investigation, collect some evidence before the case goes to the trial, before, like, you know, they have to investigate. But yes, this is a very common scenario. It might be case, like, you know, going on for years now. So that's why it's going under the old, like, you know, provisions. But now things have changed and they have made it a little complicated, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I know Section 498A where uh, all these Dory, Dory cases are uh, like, it, it's a nightmare, it's a nightmare. It's, it's a very yeah. common scenario. If you can't do anything, you just uh, file a complaint or lodge a FIR and that's it. And it, yeah, it's also, it, it's, uh, and, uh, I mean, that, 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 that is serious as well, but other cases like uh, allegations of rape, they're not investigated, um, other uh, police powers are abused. And from what I gather, I, I was, I've been looking at, um, I've had some referrals from West Bengal. Um, the police powers are absolutely uh, uh, overlooked. They're ignored by the police. They're just um, telling women who have been subject of rapes, mm. victims of rapes, um, you know, just go back home and be quiet. Um, don't report it. Otherwise, your other female relative would be a target. I mean, what sort of a devices are so unprofessional there's no um transparency integrity uh, or anything like that and i find it absolutely horrendous and i what i'm picking up is that the police forces or the police services are um almost like the private security of whoever's in charge whoever's the chief minister there's no indep independency uh, and that is outrageous again that contradicts democracy uh, and, and human rights. Um, we've had cases from that region of violence, uh, really uh, terrible, terrible, horrendous, horrific violence, including tying uh, incendiary devices to somebody's head and then detonating it remotely. And there's like, um, uh, I had the misfortune of being sent the photographs and, and again, no, no action has been taken. And, and I, I find it extremely uh, concerning, of course, and also, human trafficking. I mean, that, that is a, a hub of human trafficking. There's no, again, there's no data available, human uh, data relating to these, because they don't keep the data. So how are you supposed to know how many um, rapes or violence or murders, etc., if you're not having the basics, collecting the data and, and collecting the what they call the FII, the first information report, except even those have been turned away. And also I've learned, it's a bit of, bit of a journey that they transfer police officers. So if a police officer has done something wrong, they transfer them. So what you're doing, you're transferring the problem. You're not having misconduct hearings. And I had the, um, if, it, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be comical. Um, I, I went to a police station in India um, to, to deal with a, a matter and very nice officer he said oh could you wait in the next room um, I'll, I'll be with you and I had some journalist uh, friends with me accompanying me and uh, because of the language problem and and um, so as we were sitting down I could just hear, hear somebody yelping and of course, being very nosy, I had to find out what was going on. And the same police officer who greeted us was thrashing this man. And I said, what are you doing? Stop. And he just looked at me in horror. You know, who do you think you are? Uh, stop me. And I said, well, no, what on earth has he done? And he said, no, no, you go back into the room. I said, no, you stop yeah. hitting him. And um, eventually, he, um, I mean, he stopped then. And then he explained, he said, he's been still, um, selling drugs. Uh, and I said, well, 
well, arrest him. If you've got the evidence, okay. arrest him. Not beat, beat him up. I mean, what's the point yeah. of that? Again, that's a breach of human rights and, and a democracy. Don't make out to be a democracy if you if you can't apply it, you know. So there's a lot of catching up done. And, and, he's, and his answer was, you know, um, he was selling drugs. So, well, arrest him. And, and he said, well, you don't understand. We've got loads of people. Absolutely. We've, he said, we've got loads of um, people who are addicted to drugs in our, uh, uh, in our state. Uh, but you don't go around beating them. You deal with them. You, again, not collecting data. And then I think he was embarrassed the way I was uh, reacting because he then tried to justify it by saying, we've got loads of drug cases and, and that our cells are full of people with, who are allegedly drug dealers, etc. And he was then went on to say that families were saying, lock up our son and our daughters, because it's now, uh, which is not widely reported, women are, are, are heavily involved in drugs as well, uh, taking them out and uh, probably selling them as well, because the two could go together. And he was saying, well, they tell us, the families tell them to put them in the cell so that they go cold turkey and go off the drug. Well, that's not, you don't do that. There should be a support mechanism. You know, if you've got addiction, where you can go, uh, how, what treatments you got, can get. And then you hear of stories where there's private hospitals who, if you're fortunate enough to have money and you can send your person affected by drugs to, for treatment, who then get you off, may get you off drugs after paying loads of money, but then get you hooked on something else. I mean, again, these are all, you know, uh, information that's come through other people and you don't, it hasn't been tested or whatever. But um, again, if you're a democracy, all that information should be on your websites, your, the state's website. We've got a drug problem, acknowledge it, don't brush it under the carpet. It's like with the transfer of police, going back to that. Yeah. What's the point of transferring the problem, um, but not actually addressing it? And then more, more recently, I, I learned that um, it's very difficult, extremely difficult to sack a civil servant because they like their jobs are for life. And that sort of explained when you read some of the cases um, in the news reports where they say that they gave the job of uh, uh, a police officer to, to the guy who died, his son or whatever, a serving police officer who died, they gave uh, the job, it passes on. And again, that, that is very draconian and extremely backward. It should be on merit examination independent um so then it makes you understand it's not having a go at people or countries or whatever and then it makes you understand why people are running away why there's an exodus where why people move um you know to to uh, migrate to work in other countries etc but then they face abuse as well and then when they return home you don't get counseling so even uh, some of the ladies we've dealt with have been victims of rapes and all sorts of things they go back home and unfortunately we haven't got the resources to make sure that they get counselling and that they are retrained or, or given a job or, or put into education to provide them with support and nobody's reporting on them because maybe they're not um people are not interested but then how are people going to find out that this happens these are the risks you face when you go i'm aware of um airports in india uh, a friend of mine uh, um, in the States, she was, goes back and forth to India and she was telling me about an airport where she's actually seen little girls going off to Saudi Arabia. The parents are sending them and we all know why, but nobody confronts them. Even immigration don't, you know, sort of challenge and say, hey, you know, mm. little girl, what, why are you going? Who, who, why, you, who's your guardian or, or your parents and things? Uh, and again, that's child abuse a breach of human rights and things so um you know we, we get the usual drivel about oh india's a big country well so what you, you still got to uh, look after those people offer those resources you've got to think you've got to get out of that mentality and um and, and make sure that they are aware of their rights and and to acknowledge that abuse is unlawful it's it, it, there's no ground to justify abuse and, uh, and so that that needs to be tackled so my next question because i think we have uh, um, i had one of the questions about uh, violence breach of human rights in west bengal i you already like you know touched that topic and uh, so would you like to say something on persecution of minorities 
if you want. Yes, we get a lot of referrals of uh, minorities in particular in Pakistan where they are of different faiths. Uh, so they could be um, Sikh, Hindus, Christian, and they're a minority in that country because they've been converted. And it's absolutely, again, being naive, a Western, grown up in a Western environment, uh, country, it, it just sounds absolutely uh, horrendous and it shouldn't be tolerated, shouldn't be accepted. Um, but, but these girls often, um, they are girls, that they, you know, it, it is child abuse um, b below the age of 18 who are just abducted and, and taken away forcefully uh, converted. So it's the weaponization of rape, that, that, that's what, what it is. It's to ethnically cleanse a region. And, and it doesn't matter who, it, it doesn't matter if, um, you know, she's of, of the same faith or, uh, as the country, it shouldn't be happening because it's child abuse, it's inexcusable. Nobody can justify that. And again, um, we, are, we have uh, filed a report with the, uh, parliamentary group on this and uh, it is of concern and I find it horrendous that um, uh, even Western countries seem to be ignoring this. Um, it's not like uh, con um, of concern, there's no right up on, there, there may be and I haven't come across it but it's not as seen as um, child abuse. I mean it, in this country we've got loads of um, legislation and, and support and, and the police are aware of it, that it's child abuse and it should, should be addressed. Um, but in, in those countries, it isn't. And then they are, are put away in homes. Nobody knows who runs these wretched homes. And, but the abusers are allowed to go into the homes. So what's the point, point of that? And I find it horrendous um, organizations like the UNICEF, um, other world uh, governments, that they're not putting pressure on them because uh, nothing whatsoever justifies child abuse mm -hmm. um, so, or, or forceful conversions because that is uh, weaponization of rape. It's the definition of weaponization of rape to clear a, 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 a country or an area. I mean, I, I'm aware, again, this was all relatively new to me about the Kashmiri refugees and that they're still, um, you know, uh, they, they, they suffered the same thing, the same fate, they were driven out. Uh, again, it's not, not been on the world news, it's, uh, it's overlooked, um, it's not uh, addressed. Again, once again, that's uh, abuse of human rights and a lot can be done and should be done and it should be raised um, in, in the Western countries as well because they do um, with uh, trade with people, they've got uh, contracts with people, trade contracts, with, with people in, in these countries and it, you should look at the supply chain see what's going on what what uh, what, what are there human rights is a feature in the western countries definitely is in when, when you deal with a, i'm sure you know savita when you deal with a, a contract ma matter that there's about uh, there's human rights considerations and now re more recently with mod so-called modern slavery as i say i don't like using that word because there's nothing modern about slavery it's it's it's, it's still here it's been ongoing and, and it should be um, challenged. And I think that's the other thing, people don't challenge, they haven't got the right tools to challenge it. They don't even know when they are uh, subjected to um, abuse. They, they don't know that they've got a right to live. I mean, one of them, I, I still sort of get angry and I have to sort of um, explain to the person, yeah. for example, recently, it, it, the ladies in Iraq, they were referring to their enslaver as their owner. I find that that comes across all the time, my owner. And I said, no, he's, he's not your owner. He's your enslaver. It's wrong. Nobody owns you. You're a free person. But to them, that's not, you know, uh, that's, that's not, not the situation. That's not the reality. That that needs to be addressed as well. And I, again, I, I don't know what you, uh, for example, in India, what the education system is like at uh, university college level, whether they teach them these things that, um, so that it can filter down, even in school, there should be um, sort of civil, civic studies or something to let people know about their rights. They shouldn't feel that they are, um, can be owned, but maybe the circumstances and the situations, that are, that's how they are, yeah. and that they reflect yeah, exactly. that. Yeah. Language. 
Yeah, the way it is like, you know, it's taught as one of the subject, as you said, in the school, like, you know, civics. And uh, then if you opt for some political science, like, you know, so it's taught about all the rights, but it's all theoretical. So it's not much going into practice. So people know, like, you know, this is the right to work, right to life, right to life. But it's not put into practice. So people don't have the practical information. People are getting enlightened now. If you hear, yeah. like people are, are aware, getting aware, but it's not, uh, it was never the case before. So no. yeah, things are changing, but it's very slow, lot to be done. And uh, yeah, it, it needs to be brought into people's life, like in an everyday's life, they need to understand. Yeah, and also in legislation, in, in legislation, employment uh, rules, uh, legislation in India, I don't know, um, you know, how, how, how they are, how good they are, um, but um, in tested in court, it should be uh, in, in employment contracts and things. I've seen so much unfairness, uh, even, even with, the, with the contracts between the migrant worker and their so-called agents, it's not that it, it doesn't exist. You know, and um, lack of awareness. And, and they get absolutely, absolutely an awareness, and and I think it's the responsibility of uh, the local government, the schools, um, to to, to um, make sure that they are. And of course, legislation. But if the legislation doesn't exist in the first place, then um, no wonder they're getting away with it. And they, and you know, it's free for all. But it's an exploitation of uh, the, the the people. Um, these migrant workers who could, um, when well, they're exploited in their own countries, and then they go away and get exploited there and come back. So um, it, it really needs to be addressed. There should be a, mm -hmm. a movement around it, in my view, uh, awareness. Yeah. And it, it, it's there. And if you are a democracy and the world's largest democracy, then you should be playing, mm -hmm. uh, paying homage to, to human rights. It should be incorporated in every aspect of um, life. I think we are having a you know, very constructive chat, very like, you know, informative discussion here. And uh, I think uh, what I've noticed because I had prepared a list of some questions to ask and uh, we have touched almost all of them. Anything you think that uh, we have not, uh, I have not asked you or anything you would like to touch. So, and uh, yeah, because Rashmi, I think our, uh, we dedicated an hour for this. Yes, and, and, to actually, like uh, and how you um, want people to help, how people can help in the charity, like, you know, um, whichever way they can help. Thank you. Um, that's very kind of you. Um, well, basically, we, we are looking for people to, to join, link with, who can contribute. It's, it's no good talking about these things. You've got to provide the solutions. You, it's no good protesting about these things unless you're not providing the solutions, the workable solution so I think it's a responsibility of all as I said with, with my understanding of uh, of the Dhanmik faith they encourage uh, human rights they, they pay, pay reverence to them so let's implement them let's do that our charity relies on donations we uh, would like to continue to do, do this work we believe that this work isn't being done one-to-one -one help is not being provided and uh, you know we're collecting a lot of um, important data and 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 make creating awareness. We want that to continue. So, um, for example, as I said, with, with these women, migrant workers, women or, or men, when they go back home, there's no counselling, and they're being through trauma, and, and that's not exaggeration. We've had cases where um, people have gone there to work as drivers in in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And they've been abandoned in a desert to work as camel herders. That is no, that is the truth. That, that we've got loads, there are several cases of those that's happening, and it's probably ongoing. But we it's trying to contact them. So we, we want people to reach out to us. Our uh, website, you've got the details of our website. It's justiceupheld.org.uk, and we will help them. We and, and make sure that they are, um, you know, freed and, and returned home. Um, but in order to the, do that work, we, we would like donations so we can continue to run and, and, and that's for administrative costs and employing people to um, help us because there's only few of us in the organisation and few volunteers, but we want to expand that because there is a great need. It's amazing how people um, who have been successful or we've helped and they come back or they refer our details to other uh, people who are in trouble. And then we aim to help them 
and, and we do. Um, so so that, that's the, we, we, we don't want to go away, but that, that we feel that there is a need. These yeah. cases are not covered yeah. by other organisations, mm -hmm. which sometimes, because they're politically motivated, but we are not politically motivated. We are essentially the pure essence of human rights. That's what we advocate. And that's what we stick by. We're not interested in where you're from, what your religion is or whatever. We, we, if, if it's a breach of human rights, we will aim to help you. No, no, it's, it's really amazing. It's, uh, and especially for the people who can't, uh, who don't have access to the resources, they don't have access to justice, and they don't know where to look for. Like, you know, in Sarajit's case, as you said, like, you know, they didn't have, that they were not even aware if there was a help available. It was lucky that you reached and like, you know, things happened. But um, well, it's really amazing. People, yeah, you definitely yeah. need contribution and donations. No, thank, thank you so much. But that was, um, uh, sadly, that was, it wasn't a success because he, he was murdered. That wasn't within our control. His case was a political potato, hot potato. And, you know, and so, um, unfortunately, again, I was invited to the inquiry. I'm still waiting. Uh, we haven't had the inquiry and there's not going to be inquiry. So he, they've got away with it scot-free. Nobody's put, made them, make, put them to account. Um, so um, I, I did make submissions. I was invited over and I said, well, no, I'm not going to come over. They did say, we'll guarantee you security. And I said, well, no, well thank you, but no, thank you. I, I will make my submissions in writing. And it's now he was murdered in, in, on the 1st of May 2013, 2021, no inquiry. There's not going to be one. So that, that, that's the end of that. And, and that is outrageous. And no, nobody's putting them to task to find out what happened and that's what happens with other cases in in um uh, the, the uh, in the gulf countries as i said in that guy uh, in that case where the, gen the young man was um killed the cement the hot cement uh killed him there's been no personal injury claims um, no amount of money would ever compensate his family but the fact that he hasn't received justice but there's loads of these cases you don't hear from them I'm just amazed that like we've now got WhatsApp uh, and all Facebook, all forms of communication. What about in the 70s and things, people who have died and, and, and you know, and mysterious circumstances, there's been no justice for that. But I'm grateful for uh, this opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. And just, it's been really very, you know, insightful conversation. And uh, uh, yes, there are so many things in India which needs to be changed. People don't even recognize that this is violation of human rights. They just take it normal and natural that, okay, this is always, this always happens. Uh, but yes, uh, the present generation is awakening. Uh, future looks bright. Uh, things are changing and uh, hope we have many more established lawyers like you, more and more girls become lawyers and take up on this uh, task to change the laws and get the entire system needs to be revamped and yes, fingers crossed, we will be there. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of lots of comments here, uh, especially from Sheila. You know, I just want to say some things uh, there. Uh, she has been commenting that you are amazing breadth of knowledge and experience displayed by Jas. Uh, that's mm -hmm. Sheila there, and uh, she says uh, it is lovely and knowledgeable of Jas to refer to karmic fates. Koti koti pranam to Jas. You are true humanist, and Thank all that. You. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, yeah, and uh, yes, there's lots of topics to be spoken about, but uh, yeah, we are short of time, but uh, I wish it could go on and on, but uh, we are all, we leave this session with uh, information and uh, uh, awareness to uh, point out anyone who is going through uh, things which they ought not to. And yes, please do let us know how we can connect to Justice uh, Upheld. Uh, Justice Upheld is uh, a charity which we need to connect. And I will also give um, 
uh, I will ask Sarika here to display the logo for justice upheld on the screen. Sarika, are you there? Yeah, and I'm go I also would like to uh, read out loud uh, her uh, website, uh, just Advocate Just Upal's website. Uh, Sarika, you can just uh, paste it on the chat, her website. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do that. Yeah. And we can say it loud as well for the Facebook viewers. It's uh, www.justiceupheld.org.uk. A Google search would lead you there and people can contact them. It's got the contact um, uh, details, email, WhatsApp, and also um, a, an inquiry form on, on the actual website that they can fill in. Um, and the cases there can be translated into um, various languages around the world. So do please check them out. And that, that's another way of learning no, case studies. Um, again, we're, we're looking for people to do the case studies because we haven't got the resources uh, to do it ourselves um, all, all the time because we're all involved in full time employment. So, um, yeah, anyone who wants to volunteer, subscribe or is aware of cases, we, we, we want to know. We, we will Are you taking college interns? Would be lawyers? That, that would be excellent. We have reached out and we find pe um, people, if commitment sometimes can be a thing. We haven't got an office. So um, with, with this post um, uh, COVID situation, um, hopefully we, we, we'll, will um, get, get an office, but until then it will be online. It's not insurmountable, it can be done. So um, we, we want to, we want to give talks to university students, colleges, even schools, um, and, and we're happy to um, do that. Again, that's all voluntary, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, not for money or anything like that, but it's, um, it needs to be done there. It's a service, it's like everything, you know, other, other ways of helping the communities uh, around the, the world that, that people who really need to um, ha have this sort of reach out, know that there is somebody there who, who can, or an organization who can attempt to help them. Thank you so, so much. And uh, yes, so uh, though we started with the top with the topic employability, employment uh, issues, you know, but we'll come on to that sometime later, because it's a very big issue in UK, where the Indian women, many of them join some office or the other and they are uh, given notice, uh, serve notice without any, uh, you know, information and without any reasons, valid reasons. And it's been I have have uh, heard loads of loads of such stories so we will come back to it sometime later i would like to say thank you very much to savita bansal who could join us as host at the last minute and uh, we are we are indeed very very privileged that we could have such an esteemed uh, uh, lawyer advocate on our platform this is indeed inspiring Indian woman in front of us, Advocate Just Opal. All the best to you for your charity, uh, Justice uh, Upheld. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining Thank us. You. We take Thank you for Thank now you. and uh, do keep uh, watching the space because we've got loads of things coming up this weekend as well. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye Sarika. Bye. bye, Sheila. Bye, bye, Jeff. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Savita. No worries. No worries.